So I would like to introduce the workshop. I'm the Director General of the International Institute of Refrigeration. And we wanted to present you the projects of clean and efficient refrigerant solutions for food and health sec care sectors in developing countries, because we have a lot of challenges in these developing countries, and um, it is important to understand them. So I, I would like to present you very shortly these challenges and then give the floor to the various speakers uh, regarding the various projects we have. Next. So first, we need to extend the cold chain for both food and health sectors. For instance, the cold chain for food, I mean production and processing, refrigerant transport, cold storage, commercial and domestic refrigeration. You must know that 46% of food production should be refrigerated and less than half is refrigerated according to our data within the IIR. Uh, and thus we have food security, health and nutrition issues. Secondly, the cold chain for plants, seeds, and so on, but the cold chain is also used for healthcare products such as vaccines, and uh, you saw it uh, during the pandemic. Uh, one out of two medicines in the, on the market is heat sensitive, and the number of heat sensitive health products increased by 47% between 2011 and 2017, and the need for vaccines continues to grow. We also have a lot of other uh, uh, uses of refrigeration for cryosurgery, cryotherapy, scanners, but of course it is uh, out of the scope of, of this, uh, this workshop. Next. The population is growing. More than 800 million people are undernourished and 2 billion people more by 2000, we will have 2 billion people more by 2050 in the same regions, Africa, South Asia. And of course, we need a coaching for them. In, that, in addition, the warehouse capacity is sometimes times, times lower in developing countries than in developed countries at an average. You have here the, the, the representation of this um, uh, capacity storage. It is, it is to, for storage, but it is the same, exactly the same for commercial refrigeration, for uh, domestic refrigeration, for transport refrigeration. You see the difference between France and Philippines and New Zealand. Next. In addition to these challenges, we should reduce the impact on climate change. You already know certainly the issue of regarding refrigerants, chlorinated gases, CFCs and CFCs are or will be banned thanks to the Montreal Protocol. The issue of the stratospheric ozone layer is almost behind us, except the future of the bonds. But chlorinated gases, CFCs and CFCs and CFCs are potent greenhouse gases and you have the Kigali Amendment. You have here the, the figure regarding uh, the evolution of HFCs, HFCs, CFCs uh, in the past. You see the importance of these uh, refrigerants and the increasing part of HFCs. Next. We will update the Kigali Amendment. You certainly know it. Uh, and uh, you see the difference and the, the the, the, the fact that in, develop, in developed countries, we already have to phase down HFCs. In developing countries, we will have to do it very early now. Next. An important issue is also the energy consumption. The ocean sector, cold chain, air conditioning, heat pumps, cryogenics accounts for 7.8% of global greenhouse gas emissions. 37% are due to refrigerants, 63% are due to energy production and transport. And in addition, 20% of global electricity consumption and global electricity demand for refrigeration could more than it represent 20%. And the, the, this figure could more than double by 2050. And thus we have environmental, but also infrastructure issues, especially in rural areas. We have here the various figures. Next. So we already have projects which are sometimes just finished or are underway. And it is important to show you how it is um, possible to practically implement strategies in various countries, in various developing countries, as I explained you. And all these examples are in Africa and South Asia because they are the most important challenges now. Some will be presented today. 
Sofia, with, on pharmacies and hospitals in Africa, Bangladesh, the coaching for food, Indiplus, which is a project of nature, on natural refrigerants in India, uh, the African Center in Sustainable Cooling, and the coaching book. We already have main actions. Africa and South Asia, but also other countries could be concerned. We have funds for these projects, and then would like to thank United Nations bodies, the World Bank, SMAP here, the European Commission, countries, and here we have projects financed by Norway. Other funds, of course, are welcome because needs are enormous. Next. So the program of the workshop. First, we will have a presentation of the EU SOFIA project. It is a project financed by the European Commission on sustainable off-grid solutions for pharmacies and hospitals in Africa. So um, Oliver uh, will uh, replace Michael Kofeld from the University of Karlsruhe and will present it just after my presentation. Next time, we will have a, the second presentation is the Red Bank project managed by the IIR. Uh, which is uh, financed by the World Bank, and the subject is improving cold chain in livestock and meat sector in Bangladesh. So you will have a presentation of the World Bank because it is a very, a very important project, including the technical project dedicated uh, that where the IR was uh, responsible of, and you will have presentations by uh, Bayezid Kazi from Bangladesh. Uh, Monash University, Judith Evans from the U UK University, and Jos Alush from the IIR regarding this World Bank project. Then you will have a presentation of Indiplus, which is a project financed by, the, by Norway, um, supporting Indian refrigeration and air conditioning sector in the transition towards more environmentally friendly technology. And Armin Hafner from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology will present it. Then you will have a presentation of the Africa Center of Excellence in Sustainable Cooling and Cold Chain and Cold Chain Hubs by Toby Peters from the University of Birmingham. Then another presentation about the IR Cold Chain Book, Design and Operation Good Practice Guide for Work in Cold Rooms for Agriculture Produce and Food in Hot Climates by Giovanni Cortella from the International Tuffer Duration. This project is financed also by the World Bank, SMAP. And then we will have a discussion with a panel of experts moderated by Lili Riai from UNEP with representatives of FAO, UNEP, World Bank, and, and another one from UNEP. So um, I will now give the floor to uh, Michael Kaufer, to, sorry, Oliver, who will represent Michael Kaufer. I just wanted to mention the fact, and Michael Kaufer, however, is here. Um, uh, I, I would just like to insist on the fact that we will have um, a short time to, for all the presentations, so I will ask all the speakers to respect the, the time schedule. And uh, if you have any question, please mention it in the chat. If we ha will have time, uh, I will ask the speakers to answer to the questions. If not, of course, you will have the possibility afterwards to um, address the questions to the speakers. So now, Oliver Schmidt. Oliver, you have the floor. Uh, yes. Michael, you want to mention something? Yes, I would just like to welcome everyone uh, the presentation on Sophia. And uh, we got this project uh, together with partners, and Oliver will present. Initially, we were also looking at the food uh, chain, but uh, then we really pharmacies and hospitals are in much more in the chain because a lot of focusing on the food chain. Um, but for the hospitals, there, were, there was, to our knowledge, nothing. And uh, to just uh, elaborate refrigerants, which you mentioned, uh, to our opinion, uh, the synthetic uh, alternative to the HFC is the HFO. Uh, are good because they are drinking water. Uh, Sophia project is focusing on refrigerants and Oli is the guy who is managing the project. Oli will get his PhD on the subject. 
is the one who knows all the details. So Oli, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, yeah, as you can see, uh, I'm talking about the SOFIA project and the SOFIA is an acronym for Sustainable Off-Grid Solution for Pharmacies and Hospitals in Africa. Next slide. Uh, just a small introduction to myself. Yeah, my name is Oliver Schmidt. I'm currently at the Hochschule in Karlsruhe and I'm working uh, for Michael's Institute with it, uh, the Kälte Klima Umwelt Technik Institute or, uh, yes, uh, next slide, please. Yes, so um, as Mr. Coulon already gave a good impression uh, about the situation in Africa. And uh, yeah, I also collected some information and some background of the current situation there. Um, on the left, you can see the electrical supply situation on the African continent. In yellow, in the yellow dots, you see the population of the country in millions of inhabitants. And the more turquoise, the poorer the electricity supply. And you can already see that in the sub-Saharan region, there are a lot of people have don't have electricity or access to electricity. And uh, which I will show later is that the SOFIA project is taking place in Burkina Faso, in Cameroon, Uganda, and Malawi. And these four regions uh, are um, because we want to show that our prototype is working in four different climatic regions. On the right side, you can see the cooling demand um, and the uh, and a forecast for 2040. The cooling demand as it was in 2080 is on the left. And you can see um, uh, the yellow bars represents the uh, inhabitants or the number of people living in, in the African continent. And the blue bar is the number of people living in the rest of the world. And on the African continent, the inhabitants will almost double due to the stated policy scenario and the African case um, study. Um, yes, and also, uh, like Mr. Coulon already said, uh, a rising living standard and the increase of the ambient temperature due to climate change is also responsible for the higher cooling demand in 2040. And this is represented by the yellow and blue dots. It is therefore very important to become active in Africa and to install environmental friendly technologies there already, and this will, uh, which the technology can then be used as a model for a sustainable future. Next slide, please. Uh, the main focus of the SOFIA project, as Michael was already uh, saying, is on hospitals. On the left side, you can see a common Af African uh, operation theater where the SOFIA partner operieren in Africa used to carry out their surgeries. In 2014, they built their own hospital, the Dr. Zidogo Hospital, which is a little bit outside of the city of Leo. Um, and this hospital is well equipped, thanks to many donations from all over Europe. But nevertheless, there are problems because of insufficient energy supply. And also the wa drinking water is slightly uh, contaminated. Next slide, please. Uh, to face these problems, which I just mentioned, we came up with the idea to put all technologies inside a 40-foot container so we can ship the technology even to the most remote facilities. The container itself get their power from PV panels, which also provides the shade for the container. Moreover, we want to uh, supply electricity in case of a power failure. We also uh, want to give the patients clean drinking water so they can recover well. Um, and the clean drinking water can also be um, heated up to provide hot water and even steam if required to, um, to sterilize the medicine equipment. In another container, we want to uh, install the technology, uh, the, the, the cooling technologies. There's a refrigeration of medicine at five degrees Celsius and also the possibility to store food uh, at five degrees Celsius. Then there is a low temperature room uh, for storing protein-based drugs and blood plasma at minus 30 degrees Celsius. And also inside the room, there are small um, freezing freezer boxes going to an ultra low temperature storage um, of minus 70 degrees Celsius. And uh, what's optional and what's mentioned here, we will also want to uh, give the surgical or intensive care unit a little bit of cooling uh, in case they don't have an AC already installed. 
Next slide, please. Yeah, here's the first concept um, we designed back in September. The project started in October, so it's a little bit <laughs> it only schematic. Uh, on the left side, you can see the cooling container with the PV on top. And on the right side, you can see the water treatment container. And on the top right corner, you can see um, what's called a PV med port from our partner, Simply Solar. And this is a satellite station where um, we can go into more rural areas and give some medicine, um, some cold water, and uh, also inform the people about the Sophia containers. Um, yeah, this, this is all done in, in this satellite station. There's also VP PV installed on the top, and uh, a small refrigeration system is foreseen to be ins installed inside. Next slide, please. <laughs> Yeah, here uh, is the concept of the Sophia cooling container, and I want to go a little bit more into detail here uh, because I think it's uh, the most interesting for the cold chain. Um, and yes, so on the left, you can see the initial plan, how it looked back in September. To achieve the three temperature levels, we are using a three-stage cascade system. The propane or R290 a uh, refrigerant cycle provides an evaporation temperature of minus five degrees Celsius, which is used to freeze an ice storage. Here, this is the, it's marked in blue, and you can see it here, these two boxes. Um, yes, and in parallel, it's cooling down the plus five degree uh, room, storage room for medicine and food. We also use a CO2 refrigerant cycle due to the high ambient temperatures, uh, CO2 is only used um, as in the second stage to avoid a condensation above the critical pressure. The CO2 stage cools down um, the minus 30 degree Celsius room. And inside, as I said, is the uh, freezer box, which is um, cooling down to minus 70 degree. But when we looked at the PNID, we thought, hey, uh, it looks very easy. So why don't we make it more interesting? So this is how the system looks right now. <laughs> Uh, the reason was not, uh, next slide, please. Yes, uh, the reason um, was not out of curiosity. Uh, this was because it reduces massively the filling quantity of the flammable refrigerant uh, to R290 um, because um, it can, the system uh, is, is cooling down the um, CO2 and uh, the thermal energy storage is now charged by a two-phase thermosiphon, also called a uh, natural circulation evaporator. This thermal energy storage is loaded during the day when we have a surplus of the, um, of the electricity um, generated by the PV system. During the night and when the PV system is not providing sufficient energy, the propane compressor, which is the main energy consumer, is turned off. Hence, a lot of the environmental questionable, environmental questionable lithium ion batteries can be saved. The condensation of the refrigerant is in these cases then uh, achieved by the ice storage. So we are condensing over the ice storage. A total of uh, around 1,500 kilograms of ice will be enough to bridge two days of no energy or electricity coming from the PV panels. The small CO2 compressor still uh, runs on the energy stored in lithium ion batteries, so we can't get rid of all the batteries. The deep freezer boxes are filled with ethane. As Michael mentioned, we are focusing uh, only on natural refrigerants and re uh, ethane only has a GVP of six. So um, yeah, this is all, all the refrigerants are uh, natural refrigerants. And uh, an ethane deep freezer is currently also tested in our laboratory. Next slide, please. Uh, here you can see the concept of the water treatment container. Uh, the, the system is a low pressure system to um, save a lot of energy. Uh, since we don't need any pumps, the uh, system or, or the water storage is built up a little bit higher and only one, uh, 0 0.1 bar is enough to pump the uh, water or to, to press the water through the UV filter system. With air and the UF filter system or ultrafiltration system, a predominant share of bacteria can already be filtered. 
Remaining bacteria and viruses are eliminated in the UV light treatment. If the water contains heavy metals or the minerals, uh, the mineral content is above the limits, the capacitive uh, deionization or CDI softening um, yeah, is then activated. The soft water is either run is either cooled. This is a little bit uh, different here because here um, we foresee that we don't have to soften the water. We can cool it right after the UV light. But um, if there are heavy metals, we can cool the water right after the CDI softening to provide drinking water at 15 degrees Celsius. And uh, if the hospital needs steam for disinfection or sterilization, um, it is run through the Scheffler collectors. Next slide, please. Here you can see uh, the time schedule. We are still in time. The project started in October. We are now currently in month six of the project. Um, we are now still in work package one. We will define the boundary condition for the SOFIA systems. And um, as I will show a little bit in, in a second, uh, we have found almost all of the hospitals uh, in Cameroon, Malawi, and Uganda, and the hospital of, uh, of Operieren in Africa in Burkina Faso was already fixed. Yes, and we have the design and prototype and testing. And uh, besides, yeah, we're also doing socioeconomic analysis um, at, in, in the countries. Yes, and on the right side, you can see the map of Africa. Um, the main manufacturer is in South Africa, and uh, the technologies and also the uh, laboratories and research is all, all done in Europe and the technology and know-how is then given to um, South Africa and then we will ship the containers to Malawi, Cameroon, Uganda and Burkina Faso. Next slide please. Yes, here you can see the consortium. In total we are around uh, 50 participants, 20 in Africa. We are 13 project partners um, under the coordination of uh, <coughs> Hochschule Karlsruhe or University of Applied Science Karlsruhe. Um, there also is the IIR, which is responsible for the communication and also for the template of the slides, for example. <laughs> uh, we are in eight countries and five in Africa. And <coughs> in the four years period, we want to achieve our goal to set up um, eight containers or four pairs of containers at the four hospitals. And speaking about the hospitals, we can go to the next slide. On the left, you can see the hospital site in Burkina Faso from our partner. Uh, it's a smaller um, facility south of Leo, and you can see it's a, in a very rural area. And um, yeah, the uh, on the top uh, on the bottom left there are five guest houses. And on the top right, there are the operation theaters and also the patient rooms and the maternity. On the right side, um, this is the hospital in Uganda. I only have a picture um, of the operation theater, but uh, this uh, is in Buvuma, and Buvuma is the a big island in the Victoria Lake. Uh, it's also very rural. It takes about one day to go there from the capital. And yeah, this is our second. Um, Hospital, partner hospital. Next slide, please. Yes, here uh, in Cameroon, we are progressing uh, with the selection of the whole hospital. Uh, next week, we will decide which hospital it's going to be. Um, but this uh, hospital we foresee is south of uh, Douala, or uh, another one is right in between Douala and the capital, Yohande. And uh, also in Malawi, the selection of the hospital is also still in progress. We established contact uh, to Dr. Bonnet and our partner from Makareri University will travel to Malawi next week and will um, visit all the potential hospital sites. Next slide. And also the last slide. Uh, yeah, Ina from IIR told me to uh, say that you are free to join us and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Insta, uh, LinkedIn, and YouTube. We are also setting up our website. And yeah, there you can get all the information about the Sophia project. And uh, in the near future, there will be a lot more content coming from the universities. And then you can see the progress of the Sophia project. So we can go 
to the very last slide. <laughs> now you can take out your phones and scan the QR, QR code. But um, yeah, the website is still under development and will be launched soon. Thank you very much. And yeah, I'm open for questions. Uh, thank you very much, Oliver. I don't see any question in the chat, but of course, if there are other uh, questions afterwards uh, during the other presentations, uh, we will uh, address them. So thank you very much for having respected the time schedule. Uh, I would also like to add the fact that uh, we in the International Turf Federation are in charge of the dissemination of, of the information, and uh, it is uh, so our pleasure to um, host this workshop. And thank you for the uh, main player, Hue, which is the University of Karlsruhe. So now I would like to give the floor to the next presentation, which is dedicated to the World Bank project, improving cold chain in livestock and meat sector in Bangladesh. And uh, Christian Berger from the World Bank will, be, will present the whole project because it is a very uh, important project in Bangladesh. And then afterwards, uh, there will be some presentations regarding the part uh, which was uh, dedicated to the IIF. So, Christian, you have the floor. Thank you very much, DJ. Uh, next slide, please. So, the, the name of the project is LDDP, Livestock and Dairy Development Project in Bangladesh. Uh, I will be making this presentation. I'm the, the team leader for the World Bank of this project based. Bangladesh, and I supervise the whole investment portfolio of the World Bank in Bangladesh, which I'll present shortly. The, in a nutshell, my presentation will uh, show that uh, LDDP is above all to enhance the productivity and growth of the livestock for poverty and We, while, while implementing this project, it's clear that green cooling technologies for livestock value chain are very crucial, uh, not only to increase production capacity. And while we are supporting project implementation, uh, we benefited from a trust fund from SMAP, SMAP uh, to look at clean and energy efficient cooling solutions for livestock supply chain. This, this work is being led by. Next slide, please. Very shortly, uh, Bangladesh is actually the number one client of the world, well, all sectors included. And we have a very strong portfolio in agricultural food sector. We operate six operations. In total, is about two billion dollars. Two billion, and out of this two billion, LDDP is undertaken by the Ministry of Livestock and Fisheries for uh, twenty-five percent. Some other projects we are operating in Bangladesh do also um, consider blockchain. Uh, Next slide. So why do we invest in livestock uh, in Bangladesh? Um, I'd say you know because it's just natural to invest in the sector. It's um, every every household has livestock in Bangladesh. Almost um, in the country. Livestock offers huge potential for poverty alleviation. It's a significant part of the uh, Demand is growing rapidly with uh, the changing uh, food habits, consumption patterns, and livestock supply chains depend on very uh, uh, small farms. So a myriad of pretty small or in subsistence farming today, and which would or should get better integrated, more modern value chain, having the capacity. Next slide. 
So LDDP is a $500 million project over five-year period. We are extending this period by two years. It was, um, they, I mean, the project objective is basically to raise productivity, increase market access, and uh, develop resilience and manage risk in livestock mining chain. Um, it covers dairy, poultry, red meat from, from cattle. No, a minute. Next slide. The project is operating across the country, throughout the country, with four uh, components productivity improvement at farm level, market linkages, value chain development, including infrastructure construction. Uh, risk management and climate resilience, including THP emission reduction, and project management. As a matter of fact, with COVID, we had to uh, mobilize part of the resources for an emergency assistance program, a bit less than $100 million, to provide cash transfers for business continuation for smallholders, dairy, and food trade. Next slide. So why clean cooling solutions for livestock in Bangladesh? Uh, products are perishable um, and uh, a well-functioning cold chain uh, needs to be uh, integrated in the value chain in, in Bangladesh. One of the challenges is to mainstream access to energy in all areas. Um, demand for cooling is increasing in Bangladesh in general, in the livestock sector also, and uh, we anticipate that rising temperatures uh, will further exacerbate the issue, increasing the demand for cooling appliances. Um, then, uh, as DDA mentioned, we also have this issue of uh, refrigerants contributing to the performance. Uh, so, providing affordable, efficient, clean, whole chain solutions for the livestock sector uh, will, we believe, help unlock the sector's potential in Bangladesh. And also, we, uh, there is one of the things we found in the study, we'll see later, I guess, the presentation is that public awareness on, on, on food safety uh, uh, needs to increase, particularly about cold chain benefits of cold chain. Next slide. So, what will NDTP do for uh, cold chain development? NDTP has uh, uh, significant funding uh, to invest in uh, farm productivity enhancement and grants for producer groups providing equipment and above all for cold chain matching grants for uh, upstream and downstream industry. So industries that are providing inputs to livestock farmers and downstream industries processing uh, livestock products. So the project has uh, uh, money, resources, to subsidize uh, producer groups and industries to make the right investment in that nature. Um, among these uh, critical investments are village level milk collection centers. We're actually building producer groups together of about 30 farmers each, and we're regrouping many producer groups in delivering to a village milk collection center, which, uh, so with this chain. And uh, these village milk collection centers would then deliver to dairy hubs where modern processors We're also developing a few modern slaughterhouses 
there are opportunity for artificial insemination in the process. Um, and next slide, please. Um, so SMAP stands for Energy, Energy Sector Management Assistance Program. SMAP provided a grant to the World Bank team to undertake a study. Uh, what we're looking at is a comprehensive diagnostic of needs for food systems across livestock value chains in Bangladesh, identifying climate-friendly solutions and elaborating suitable business models for farmers and the, the key activities, but I guess you'll hear more about that in a minute. Uh, market needs assessment for cold chain, uh, reviewing relevant business models, investment plans, and training material to develop sustainable cold chain in the livestock sector in Bangladesh, preparing a policy note for the government provide recommendations on key action for environment, and also preparing an operation note for, for people like me at the World Bank or supervising projects across the world in the livestock sector. Next slide. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I won't speak about the recommendations because this is a topic of speakers. Just we, 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 we learned a lot working on, on, on this topic and uh, we were very thankful to the IIR to partner with uh, other uh, with universities and with uh, local partners that have a better view of what's needed in Bangladesh for coaching. Slide. I think it's, a, it's the same to slide. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Christian. Uh, I would now like to continue the presentation with the part which was dedicated to the IR for in, within that project. And thus, I will give the floor to Bayezid Kazi, um, Judith Evans, and Jos Alouche. So please, I think Bayezid will start. Um, thank you, uh, Didier. Uh, welcome to our presentation on improving uh, cold chain in livestock and meat sector in Bangladesh. Uh, this work is funded by the World Bank, as you already uh, probably know, and IRR is the project lead with RD R R and T, uh, University of Birmingham, Harriet Watt University, Pratt University, and PUT as the collaborators. I am Bayezid Kazi, a professor of chemical engineering at Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. In today's presentation, uh, we'll cover the current status and uh, technological needs in the meat and milk sector in Bangladesh. Uh, next slide, please. So around 65% of uh, total population in Bangladesh uh, still live in rural areas. Uh, traditionally, families in rural areas uh, own a cow or two. Uh, this is still true. So uh, there are a large number of farmers having less than five cows. And uh, the, the, uh, the farms uh, uh, are uh, usually small uh, and medium scale. The sector, uh, both the sectors are uh, growing steadily. Uh, the meat production is enough to meet the total demand. However, the milk production is still less than uh, what we need. Uh, so far, the growth in uh, these sectors ha have been in numbers, uh, but keeping the traditional mode of operation. Uh, cattle are still slaughtered in wet markets. Uh, poultry are uh, sold in live markets and milk uh, directly uh, sold to the customers without chilling. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, let's have a look at uh, the meat sector. The formal uh, meat processors are non-existent. 
it's all done in the wet market. Uh, slaughter, slaughtering in uh, the large cities are uh, fractionally done in slaughterhouses, and then the meat is transferred to the wet markets. But uh, most of the slaughtering uh, are done in the wet market. Uh, meat is sold on the same day, uh, within a few hours and without chilling. Um, you you, you uh, can see there are four pictures. The bottom two are uh, showing the uh, butcher uh, shops in a typical wet market. And uh, in the bottom left one, you may have a glimpse of the live section of the market uh, where uh, all the poultry are in, in a cage and uh, chickens uh, are killed and dressed as needed in, in the wet market and handed over to the buyers. Uh, uh, the top two uh, photos are actually showing uh, that, practice, that practice. So uh, no chilling is involved. Um, there are only a few uh, formal meat processors in the country nowadays. Next slide, please. So about the milk sector, uh, as I mentioned, there are many smallholders having less than five cows. And also the milk production per cow uh, is low. So the farmers uh, do not produce much and they are able to sell their milk to the consumers or the butter makers without any issue. If uh, for some reason it's not sold, uh, the practice is to uh, freeze the milk in domestic freezers. Uh, which is a rare, okay, uh, rare occurrence. And uh, the need for cooling uh, is yet to be realized uh, in, uh, in the small and medium sc uh, scales of milk pro production. The, the large uh, producers, uh, they do uh, chill milk, but uh, the, the practice is not very common uh, for the medium scale uh, uh, farmers. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So uh, there are a few formal processors of meat uh, um, uh, who actually started their business with a goal to export the meat, uh, mainly to Middle East and uh, some of uh, South Asian countries. Uh, however, nowadays they are also catering uh, for the local premier consumers. These uh, processors uh, have their uh, own slaughterhouses and uh, fully installed cold chain. However, their reach is uh, limited only to those who really understand the benefit of chilling. Uh, they also uh, sell to uh, top uh, premium hotels and restaurants in the country. Um, and the fact is, uh, most of the time they have to operate at low capacities uh, as the market demand is not uh, very high for uh, chilled meat and uh, they are catering to only a tiny uh, fraction of the total consumers in the country. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, the formal sector in milk is uh, much bigger than uh, meat, but it's uh, only 9% of the total uh, milk uh, sector. Uh, uh, at present, there are 14 milk processors uh, but uh, the, the production in the formal sector is dominated by uh, three large companies. Uh, their combined production uh, accounts for close to 80% of the formal market. And all these processors, all 14 of them, they have the same mode of operation. Um, so if you uh, have a look at the uh, scheme um, on the right, so they uh, actually collect uh, milk, from uh, smallholders and a uh, group of farmers. Uh, usually they have village uh, milk collection centers uh, installed in uh, milk pockets of the country where they collect the milk uh, uh, both morning and afternoon, uh, morning and evening. Uh, and the, they chill the milk before transporting the, to the processing plants. The, then the processed milk and uh, uh, packaged milk uh, is distributed through their own network. Uh, but the cold chain equipment um, in the distribution and uh, retail, uh, uh, they also vary considerably from one processor to the other. So um, with that, now I'll hand it over to Judith 
uh, to discuss on the technological needs uh, in this sector. Thank you, Bayezid. Judith, you have the Thanks, floor. Thanks, Bayezid. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, it's not as if farmers don't have ambitions to expand their operations. Um, one of the issues is that uh, land is actually at a premium. Most farms are only one or two hectares in size. And so there is quite limited ability for farmers to actually have more cows, uh, be able to collect more milk or send more animals to slaughter. There's also an issue which is often the case in developing countries where finance is an issue. It's one of the things we've looked at in the project. Uh, but farmers don't often have the collateral to buy cooling systems. Um, and also most farms are currently not large enough to really justify a cold chain for themselves. They could feed into a cold chain, but having chilling facilities actually on the farm is not really feasible for such small farms. There's also an issue as well with consumers. Uh, consumers don't actually value refrigeration or chilled foods, particularly in Bangladesh at the moment. In fact, most consumers actually consider fresh uh, non-chilled meat and non-chilled meat is actually better. Um, there is, in fact, you know, some, some issues. Uh, for example, a lot of milk is made into things like sweet meats in Bangladesh and actually using chilled milk produces a poorer quality product. It's less fluffy and acceptable to the consumer. So there's these sort of negatives that are associated with chilled products. And so really there needs to be a baseline uh, exercise where people are uh, informed and have a better understanding of hygiene and food safety, the reasons why we refrigerate foods, the benefits of it um, in terms of you know, hygiene, food safety. Uh, also as well, as Bayesid said, animals are currently killed in wet markets in uh, pretty basic conditions. There isn't really um, an understanding of animal welfare, and that's not prioritised. So there's um, a whole exercise really in educating uh, farmers and consumers, and before you can really apply a cold chain. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, saying all that, there is um, uh, a significant projected growth in both the milk and the meat um, requirements in Bangladesh. You can see on the graphs on the right, that's the capacity gap, not the total. So it's what's actually lacking as we move forward from 2020 through to 2050 for milk on the top graph and meat on the bottom graph. And you can see those projections there for high growth and low growth. And even with the low growth, there's a lack of capacity moving forward. So there is definitely, as Bayezid said, growth in the market. And this is a huge potential uh, for demand for cooling solutions in the coming decades. Next slide, please. So in terms of sustainable and clean cold chains, it makes complete sense to um, be able to install environmentally friendly solutions if the cold chain is going to develop. However, many farms are off-grid or semi-off-grid. And so there is you know, considerable potential for the use of renewable energies in Bangladesh. Uh, solar uh, photovoltaic technology is widely used in Bangladesh and it's brought electrification to a lot of rural Bang Bangladesh. So it's technology that's commonly used and understood. Biogas is also widely used for cooking. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, that in the next slide. So next slide, please. So in terms of the, the technologies that are available, uh, solar powered milk chillers are available. Uh, there's lots of options that chill up to 1000 litres of milk a day, which is often the, the sort of common size that is used in the uh, village milk collection centres. Uh, the main issue that we've noticed is that a lot of the systems don't actually use low global warming potential refrigerants. Many of them are still using refrigerants like R404A. But there is also an issue with access to newer refrigerants as well. These often are not widely available in developing economies. And so there's issues related to being able to get refrigerants into the market, training and letting people to use them. 
Uh, the, two of the main dairies that uh, Bysid spoke, spoke about, Pran and Brac, they've actually demonstrated the use of solar milk chillers in Bangladesh. You can see in the bottom right picture, that's a picture of one of the centres. Unfortunately, um, although the centres are still used, the solar panels are no longer used. And so there was obviously some issues around maintenance and operation of the solar panels. And even though solar is widely used in Bangladesh, there's still some issues around the maintenance and use. So that needs to be overcome as well. It's, it's reasonably clear from this work and other work that solar powered small milk chillers, uh, milk meat freezers, apologies, are just not feasible. It's really not feasible to put a meat chiller on a farm that's only going to chill maybe one or two animals a year. And so really the options are to go to large abattoirs and chilling plants. And the reason why meat chillers are really not feasible is that our solar powered meat chillers are not feasible is due to the high refrigeration loads at the start of the chilling process. It's just not possible really to provide, you know, practically enough solar panels to be able to do that. But solar panels can contribute to the power needs for slaughterhouses and meat storage chillers, and so certainly they should be used. Um, also, biogas systems could be used to generate uh, electricity to power milk chillers through absorption or adsorption systems. And there have been systems that have been developed in Pakistan and Africa. However, the current biogas systems that are used for cooking in Bangladesh won't be suitable uh, for a refrigeration system as there's no scrubbing of the gas. Uh, also as well, there have been some considerable problems with the biogas systems. I think they've improved over time, but uh, particularly some of the initial systems were not well designed, didn't operate well. And also farmers often don't understand the complexities of operating the biogas system. And so if their situation changes, and for example, they get more cows or they lose one of their cows, then the biogas system doesn't operate optimally. So there's quite a few issues still around biogas, even though it's widely used. Uh, next slide, please. So we're coming on now to the approach to help develop the mil milk and meat cold chains in Bangladesh. Uh, Yosh is going to talk a little bit more in detail about this, but basically uh, we're suggesting a three-step approach. There's some baseline activities, which is step one that need to be put in place. Uh, so that cold chain, uh, the need for the cold chain has to be developed in the first place and has to be support around developing it. The second stage is actually to develop and implement the cold chain, actually apply the technologies and provide the support around that. And then thirdly, it's got to be ongoing support as well, uh, because, for example, the, exa the example I gave you of the solar powered milk chillers uh, that BRAC uh, and Pran put in are uh, no longer operating as solar milk chillers. So there needs to be ongoing support, training and development to keep that cold chain going and to make sure that things are used in the future and just aren't uh, redundant. So, Josh, can I pass over to you to talk a little bit more about that approach? Uh, yes, please. Judith, just a minute. I, I, I'm sorry I didn't introduce Judith, who is a professor at the Law, Law, South Bank, London South Bank University and head of section of the Indonesian Refrigeration. So I will now give the floor to Yosra, who is a head of projects within the IA. Yosra, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Judith. Um, so in step one, as uh, Judith just said, uh, the baseline for the cold chain development for meat uh, and milk should be first established. Uh, and this is only uh, possible through the marketing of the cold chain. Uh, also adapting and adopting new policies, uh, standards and regulation to enforce laws uh, related to cold chain development. Uh, also important to ensure training to develop skills operating um, clean and efficient cooling technologies, uh, also supporting farmers to increase their productivity and create a cold chain market, and then develop financial structures uh, to enable these farmers accessing uh, to chilling facilities. 
uh, step two um, is to be applied when the baseline in step one is developed already. Uh, so for both sectors, general uh, recommendations are here given in terms of uh, a better development of uh, breeding uh, of animals and supporting uh, better animal nutrition, providing uh, agronomy services. Um, specifically for meat, uh, we recommend to install mobile uh, abattoirs and wet markets, applying low uh, carbon cooling solutions to improve uh, hygiene and animal welfare, uh, also um, as well as the um, uh, installation of cold stores, if possible, uh, due to the limited space availability in, uh, in wet markets and also uh, constraints uh, related to some logistics and uh, management. Uh, also to improve the existent or develop uh, new, if necessary, small city abattoirs and large uh, regional abattoirs applying uh, international standards. Um, now specifically for milk, uh, we recommend to support the development of the village milk collection centers, um, uh, which are carried out by the World Bank uh, operational team, um, as well as the associated hubs, uh, and operate them using uh, solar energy with integrated uh, ice storage facilities to store uh, and preserve the milk. Um, Step three, uh, step three, we support the devel developed cold chain uh, through a continuous assessment of activities uh, of step one uh, and also two. Uh, it will also adjust these activities as the market develops in terms of um, continuous need for technical support and training skills, uh, and also the implementation of uh, new regulation um, and policies. Next slide, please. <coughs> Um, so now more specifically in, uh, in step one, uh, which is related to the baseline development. Uh, so for the, uh, the uptake um, of the cold chain technology in Bangladesh, it's necessary first to raise awareness of consumer about safety um, and quality aspects of, um, of chilling. Uh, because actually, if this is not done, uh, it means uh, if this is not claimed by the consumer, uh, there will be no incentive uh, to develop a cold chain. Um, it is also vital to educate and inform consumer about those benefits, uh, and this could be through uh, education in schools, uh, using marketing campaigns, uh, or even uh, use um, the nowadays communication tools as the influencers to convince people about those benefits. Um, also, farmers need to uh, expand their operations um, to develop the market for the refrigeration, and for that they need assistance on financial opportunities uh, and suitable business models to increase their productivity, um, and for that they need um, assistance uh, with breeding, agronomy, access to uh, upstream service as um, um, veterinary service, uh, husbandry practices, uh, etc. Um, so we also recommend to encourage the formation of sustainable producer groups uh, and interprofessional bodies uh, to enable them exchanging knowledge and also resources experience uh, for a better access uh, to the available opportunities. Uh, equally important uh, is when developing the skills to consider uh, training people on um, environmentally uh, efficient, sustainable uh, and green um, technologies for cooling. Also to uh, encourage manufacturers to adopt uh, low GWP refrigerants uh, when installing uh, new cooling systems um, through technical and financial support. Uh, and also important to train um, cold chain stakeholders as operators, uh, engineers, and uh, system designers. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> Um, so more specific recommendation for step two, uh, these are related to the implementation uh, phase of the cold chain. Uh, so for meat, uh, we recommend to use the underutilized uh, abattoir facilities uh, in the form that are applied or used in the formal uh, meat sector uh, as a short term uh, solution or measure uh, to encourage more people entering um, the formal uh, sector while uh, we are uh, while developing a market uh, for the chilled meat. 
uh, also to upgrade uh, district uh, abattoirs and cities to a better uh, standard of welfare, hygiene and safety, uh, following international standards for national trade, uh, and install large central abattoirs that can accommodate uh, slaughtering, chilling uh, and processing uh, a large number of animals leading um, to a good quality of meat for national and international uh, trade. Uh, now for milk, um, ensure that the, those VMCCs or the village um, uh, milk collection centers uh, and hubs, uh, uh, so these should operate uh, primarily uh, using solar uh, technologies, solar energies, solar energy, uh, apply low uh, GWP refrigerant in the cooling facility and applying uh, thermal storage to store the milk. Uh, we also recommend implement uh, finance and business models to help uh, end -users, users, the end users managing uh, the higher capex, uh, which are related to the high costs uh, somehow of the solar technologies uh, and highlighting uh, the benefits from uh, the lower opex of these kind of systems. Um, also inform the operators about the new technolog technologies um, that are being currently investigated in developed countries as, uh, for example, the solar powered um, uh, or electrically driven vehicles and low emission fuel vehicles uh, that will be made available uh, in the next few years. Next, please. Uh, Josh, if you, you could uh, shorten the presentation. Yeah, it's only two slides left. Okay, so uh, now looking at specific recommendations for step three, uh, which is related to uh, the supporting actions of uh, the developed cold chain. Uh, step three, uh, provide with supporting activities for a clean and efficient cold, uh, cold chain development uh, in Bangladesh when it comes to a continuous monitoring and assessment uh, of activities uh, of step one and two. Uh, also supporting training and skills development within the country, um, as well as for local manufacturers. Uh, so step three uh, will also review the performance and achievement uh, of step two, uh, which is the cold chain implementation phase. Also will ensure its performance and operation assessment uh, and make sure these are operating efficiently. Next, please. So this is the last slide and here we are pre um, presenting the main output from this technical assistance to the World Bank uh, that are a baseline study for the current status of culture in Bangladesh. Uh, also training manuals, uh, brochure, PowerPoint information, and a practical guidance uh, note, including all information and recommendation uh, provided by the consortium to the World Bank uh, for the development of uh, clean and efficient cold chain um, and livestock sector in uh, Bangladesh. So these communication materials are made available for World Bank operational team engaged in livestock, uh, but also for consumer and farm farmers, uh, operators, uh, the government of Bangladesh, banks, producer organization to help them making the appropriate um, decisions uh, now to help them uh, developing uh, the future cold chain uh, and livestock sector in Bangladesh. Uh, thank you very much. I think we are we are already 10 minutes behind the, the, the schedule, so that's fine. Thank you, Jos. Uh, so in any case, the, the results of this the part of the project will be uh, very soon available. So now I would like to give the floor to Amin Hafner, from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology for the project Indie Plus. Welcome to the Indie Plus part within this workshop. My name is Armin Hafner. I am professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology and the NU in Trondheim, Norway. Within our project in Indie Plus, we are supporting the Indian refrigeration and air conditioning sector in their transition towards a more environmental and clean refrigeration technology. We are coordinating this project and with a leading team of experts from different sectors in India, we are doing this work and we are especially glad to have the entire funding provided by the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We do 
coordinate we are coordinating actions we are delivering and developing and delivering training courses and support demonstration sites to transfer knowledge into the dedicated market and sectors and not uh, not last but not least also to decision makers we are developing also r d programs for the future which help the indian refrigeration sector to to progress we also identify key regulator hurdles so the low global warming potential of refrigerant and especially the national working fluid can be made accessible and affordable in the market and by hands-on demonstration sites in real environments and made in india we are able to support this and that there will be multipliers in the future we will also utilize these new sites and some of the existing training facilities to educate new experts in the field of clean refrigeration this is our team we have uh, people from Antenu, my team we have people from IIT Madras IISC Bangalore Pits Bilani and SIFT we are also glad to have a CEW with us from the Indian side, as well as we do have a Norwegian Environmental Agency, Sintef Energy and Sintef Ocean, as well as IAR, helping us in the dissemination part. What are we doing? I will just highlight some of these demonstration sites where we focus on supermarkets, in one area together with a leading global actor we will showcase a supermarket with co2 in india starting this year it will be introduced next year in the in the, in the shop will be open next year we thereby can demonstrate that this will also work in india and we hope it can be multiplied into many many supermarkets in the region we will have two hotel demonstrators where we can showcase that CO2 is a perfect match for a hotel energy system, providing simultaneously hot water and chilled water, which is utilized in the building and is giving a huge economic benefit for the end user. These sites will be installed this year and we will be happy to report the results next year. In the marine sector, we will see a low temperature freezing application, processing, helping to process this kind of food much better and keep the quality. Again, it will be implemented this year and next year we can utilize it for training and reporting of results. We are happy if you follow our progress, we will, uh, through the IAR refrigeration news channel, we will uh, give you information when there is news but also we will announce them on our website and we open up for workshops where the global public is invited to join so with this i would say thank you and uh, have a nice uh, easter holiday visit our website and keep in touch if you have any question to me or the entire team bye bye I will now give the floor to Toby Peters, uh, who will from the University of Birmingham in the United Kingdom, who will present the Africa Center of Excellence in Sustainable Cooling and Cold Chain and Cold Chain Hubs. Toby, you have the floor. Thank you, Didier. Thank you. So if you jump forward, uh, thank you for the intro. And um, if you jump to the next slide, thank you. So just by way of background, working collaboratively Collaboratively, London, South Bank and Cranfield, Harriet Watt and Birmingham, and with other academic research and industrial and government partners, we've built a multi-million pound portfolio of projects around delivering resilient and sustainable cold chain research in both UK, Europe and developing markets. If you jump to the next slide. So to deliver calling for all in a sustainable and resilient way, 
from my perspective, there needs to be a paradigm shift to a different way of thinking that goes beyond simply taking business's normal action that typically focuses on improving the energy efficiency of individual technologies or greening electricity. And for me, the big problem is that, is that we think about energy and energy storage. We continue do dairy, to default to, to electricity and batteries. But the majority of the energy services actually that we need to support to society mouse. are thermal, heating and cooling. And in the transition to renewables, rather than simply a business as normal technology approach and greening electricity, electricity, we really need to start thinking thermally. And the key is that energy can be stored and moved to where the needs are in the form of coal, rather than converting into electricity and then converting back again to coal. So what we need to do is take a systematic approach to calling provision and rethink how we use, make, store, move, manage, and finance and even regulate coal. And rather than presupposing calling demand, we need to focus on the services that are needed that depend on calling. In other words, it's about what are the energy services rather than how much electricity is required. So if you could jump to the next slide, please. And that's sort of the background of, of our approach. But then to meet agri-economic nutrition and health goals, the urgent challenge for emerging economies is scaling farm to fork and manu manufacture to arm cold chain capacity and infrastructure, ensuring, and ensuring seamless operation from source to destination. And sustainable cold chains, chains must address all of these functional areas from the perspective of maximizing the economic and social benefits while minimizing the environmental impact of practices that otherwise negate the gains. The challenge, as we all know, is that a cold chain is a complex system. It's got many static and moving elements, and they require accountability from multiple levels, from farm to fork and manufacturer to arm. And so developing a sustainable cold chain is about far more than just a solar powered cold room at the farm gate. It's about this seamless operation from source to destination, and it's what I could call a wicked problem. Within this, leaving no one behind must sit at the core of sustainable food cold chain provision. This is because the social and economic costs of lack of access to cold chain fall on the poor, the disadvantaged, and often marginalized farmers and fishers and their community. Yes, with greater market connectivity through food, food cold chains, they can gain economic opportunity, flexibility, and resilience. Equally, efforts to expand and improve food cold chains, if not planned carefully and, and equitably, may further exacerbate inequities. So for me, the exam question we need to ask or be, be asking is, how do you create this local and global field to fork connectivity? Do you nutritiously feed 10 billion people from hundreds of millions of small scale farmers whose livelihoods are well and well being are often dependent on only one or two hectares, as well as ensure their climate change adaptation ready and resilient. And in parallel, how do you create the local and global manufacture to arm cold chains to achieve universal access to life saving vaccines and medicines? And how do you achieve all these without using fossil fuels, fossil fuels or ozone depleting and high global warming refrigerants? Next slide. ACES, ACES headquarters is hosted by the University of Rwanda in Kigali, and it will provide a first of a kind collaborative and open access hub to develop the knowledge, tools, evidence to accelerate the delivery of sustainable cooling cold chains across food and health in Africa. The program has been developed by the governments of Rwanda and United Kingdom the Environment, um, United Nations Environment Programme, United for Efficiency, and here in the UK, the Centre of Sustainable Cooling, bringing together a consortium of leading UK universities. We've got about $20 million of seed investment committed by government and industry. And the goal is to accelerate the uptake of equitable and sustainable cooling cold chains to economically empower farmers, improve access to food and nutrition, deliver food security, improve access to health, help reduce inequalities, foster low carbon development and build resilience. Next slide, slide please. ACES will act as a research and knowledge hub, proving ground and innovation center to develop, as I said, knowledge, tools and evidence. And, it, and 
Um, it will showcase new concepts, provide incubation, capacity building, and support new businesses. Next slide, please. Specialized outreach and knowledge establishments, what we call spokes, will be established across the continent to showcase how solutions can be deployed in practical applications and act as outreach learning, training, and knowledge transfer centers to support local community uptake. The spoke can exchange best practice and lessons learned through the ACES headquarters hub as part of an interconnected whole. And spokes would also identify best practices in the region and early adopters to feedback and cascade out to other technologies. The first of these is being developed in Kenya with a further three being planned and funded. ACES will replicate its model in other developing markets. And the first of these is being developed in India with the government of Telangana. Next slide, please. Specifically, ACES has a portfolio of research areas to prove understanding of food requirements through the cold chain in order to optimize the design of technology and strategies for nutritional food loss reduction, evaluate methods for improved population needs to find vaccine forecasting and stock management, demonstrate best in class emerging and novel technologies, create the capability and market for program delivery, understand the resilient and sustainable business models and develop capacity building and skills development programs across the agri-food and supply chain and then cascade, cascade these out to the spokes. Next slide, slide please. Using Rwanda and Kenya as pilot markets, we're also building a robust uh, self-organizing model which can be populated with a country's data sets to understand and develop optimize, i.e. by testing thousands of scenarios, cold chain for food and health to meet a government's mission-driven social and economic targets and mitigate the associated GHG emissions. This allows solutions to be tested prior to investment, to identify the risks and barriers and understand the best solutions. This, we think, will enable a much more sophisticated and robust approach to considering where and when to best in, invest in resources and not allocate them in a piecemeal fashion, which could be suboptimal and on the wrong timescales and scales. So from this, we can develop holistic, robust, sequence and budgeted evidence-driven delivery roadmaps with identified and quanti quantified impacts and calculate the full return on investment. Next slide, please. The program has been developed in a systematic process, starting right the way back in 2020 with a cooling needs assessment in Rwanda, that along with the existing studies already done, provided the validation, foundational underpinning, and design concepts of the center. Now, with funding secured to design, equip, and launch ACES, we're now finalizing the necessary financial support to be fully operational from 2023 with a self-sufficient business model and a portfolio of activities engaged industrial partners by mid 2025. The overarching goal is to be the Pan-Africa Applied Research Center and Knowledge, of, knowledge Center of Choice for sustainable cooling cold chain and post-harvest management. Next slide, please. As I said, ACES has its own campus in Kigali, Rwanda. And if you jump forward, Lisa. Yeah, thank you. And we're starting off with building a new refrigeration and cold chain for food and farmer demonstration and training hall. And we're refurbishing existing buildings to provide offices, meeting rooms, classrooms, and some first incubation workspaces. We're then building out a model pack house as a second phase of the demonstration hall. This will be followed by innovation and enterprise hubs, conference facilities, and the vision being through to a full technology innovation park. Next slide, please. As said, we've the funding now to build a new demo hall. Work will start this summer to be operational. Oh. Oh. Come up in early 2023. Design of this has been led by Judith Evans and her team at London South Bank working with industry. And this will include 
environmental testing and development rooms, blast chiller, freezer tunnel in the test facility, uh, variable temperature rooms for testing, a full state-of-the-art refrigeration training room, and much more. If you jump on, please. All oh, right, those were, sorry, they're all coming in. So you can see these, these pieces that we're going to have in this hall uh, by next year. I think Lisa, this is my fault. I, it was a build, sorry. And there's also external space for vehicle testing and where we can build a, 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 a portfolio of renewable energy systems, non-fossil fuel vehicles and transport refrigeration testing. And we can also look at modal shifts and in time even autonomous vehicles. Jump forward, please, Lisa. And one more. And we're also now also recruiting a full team. So we're, we're looking for a, um, a, a director for the center um, and also then technicians. We're gonna have four or five lecturers, early career researchers, PhD students, and then a team in each spoke with manager, again, technical assistance and out outreach mentoring and new market development officers. So the full team to support this both at ACES and in the spokes. Next slide, please. And finally, we're working with the government of Rwanda at the moment to establish a smart farm to build on ACES capabilities and create an end-to-end -end solutions development lab and solutions demonstration and training center for integrated sustainable agri-food systems from soil to consumer. And here with a 200 hectare farm and the ACES center, we can, can consider challenges and opportunities across the whole supply chain, primary production environment, resilient supply chains, local, regional and national and international, retail, as well as nutrition and consumption. Next slide, please. So that's sort of a very quick run through of ACES and we're very keen and happy to, to, to have, take further discussion and, and um, invite you to visit. But if we're to transform the cooling and cold chain sectors to deliver access to sustainable cooling, we have to collaborate at all levels, industry, private sector, governments, academia, and civil society among others. But if we get it right, while cooling poses a massive environmental challenge, if we can do this, it could contribute to the Paris Agreement, the SDGs, and the Kigali Amendment to Montreal Protocol. ACES is, is we think, a first of a kind center, really to bring together all the interdisciplinary researchers working across food, cold chain, sustainable energy, stakeholder industries, new technology industry innovators, cold chain users, users from the farm to the consumer to work together to create the fit for markets, check step change pathways to net zero cooling and cold chain and provide the applied research, teaching, and industrial collaboration to put into action the integrated solutions, the finance models, and also build the capacity and trained works, workforce so critically required to deliver the change. And also it can provide fundamental new knowledge and embrace unforeseen but very promising new ideas and initiatives that we think will arise as a result of bringing together this transdisciplinary community to focus on a common vision. So in closing, I would ask you, please engage. We're going to start from May to be hosting open days in Rwanda, as well as in other markets. And we think this is a great opportunity for us to work together to try and solve some of these challenges. Thank you very much. So thank you, thank you, Toby. Uh, I would like now to give the floor to Giovanni Cortella, who is professor in Italy and uh, who is in charge of our uh, working group uh, to design uh, a cold chain book. So a new cold chain book. So Hello everyone. I'm presenting you very briefly a project for a guide for the design of and operation of small cold rooms in all developing countries. 
I'm Giovanni Cortella from the University of Udine, Italy, and I've been asked to coordinate this project by the International Institute of Refrigeration. The context is a, a world population that is growing fast in some countries, especially in Africa, with peaks up to 5% per year. Prediction for the next 30 years show that the rate of change of population will decrease to about zero or even negative values in most countries, but it will remain to 3% more or less in most African countries. So to feed effectively the world's growing population, we need not only to produce more staple food, but also to improve food diversity and minimize their loss and waste. In fact, according to FAO, 30 to 40% of produce is lost in developing countries, especially vegetables and fruits and in the post-harvest phase, mostly due to spoilage. This is a loss of energy, this is a loss of efforts, but it's also a huge and useless emission of CO2. So an effective cold chain can help preventing deterioration of foods that are more sensitive to heat, thus improving nutrition in terms of quality and diversity of food accessible to people. Furthermore, increasing sales of higher value products can also foster growth for a local economy and push farmers to further exploit land. Last but not least, the higher energy efficiency of the systems will lead to a reduction in CO2 emissions. With this background, two actors decided to collaborate for a new edition of the Cold Store Guide, which was published by the International Institute of Refrigeration in 1993 and was widely used in the past, but focusing this time on hot and developing countries. So we have ASMAP, which is a technical and assistance program administered by the World Bank and boosting growth of low and middle income countries through sustainable energy solutions. And we have the IIR, which is an independent and intergovernmental organization which is promoting knowledge in all fields of refrigeration through a worldwide network of experts. And they are also co-organizers of the Three Days International Conference on Sustainability and Cold Chain, which is closing this evening. So the purpose of this guide is to present accessible practical guidance that enables readers to specify, install and operate effective and appropriate cold rooms in off-grid and weak grid situations that are as economically viable as possible. A lot of keywords in this sentence. So the audience is made of practitioners, project managers, engineers, leading the planning, design, procurement or operation or working cold rooms for small medium farms or communal facilities. The aim is to help them to have effective discussions with specialists and not to become themselves specialists. A secondary audience is also expected for managers of aid and technology programs to improve insight into the necessary technologies and business approaches. Nonetheless, the guide will also be helping local manufacturers and suppliers of cold room equipment to learn quickly about the best solutions and to avoid common mistakes. The guide covers first mile and rural markets, but is likely to be equally useful for storage at any stage of the supply chain, from field cooling to pre-cooling, storage, transport, market, retail. It is with chilled food, pre-cooling and storage, but not with frozen storage. The main focus is on horticultural, agricultural, cool storage, Milk cooling, ice production, slaughterhouse, and pharmaceuticals are not covered. As regards the power supply, weak grid or off grid solutions will be primarily phased. We are willing to recommend reliable and effective technology. This means that this guide is primarily focused on affordable, electrically driven vapor compression equipment, while doesn't attempt to address alternative cooling approaches like absorption or desorption. Passive solutions will be considered. Technologies not included are made available from other sources and are signposted. We are really know so to reduce the environmental impact. So we are trying to do that by means of energy efficiency, by using more climate friendly refrigerants, using renewable energy while focusing on photovoltaics, using well, both electrical and thermal storage. And what is most important, we are looking for affordability, short payback periods, 
and low operational costs. The book will be disseminated broadly to relevant stakeholders through the networks of ESMAP, of IIR, and of all the contributors in an electronic version and free of charge. Some tools to aid decision making will be included, reference will be made to some practical case studies, and more detailed resources for the topics not that well will be signposted. Plans are to make it available by the end of this year. So I wish to acknowledge the team for now made of ESMAP, IIR, and many contributors whose list is still growing. I mention here just the acronyms of those involved up to now. However, we welcome interested reviewers to contact IIR at the email address you see here. Thank you for your attention. So now I will give the floor to Lili Riai. Uh, who, will, who is um, the head of the Cool Coalition in the United Nations Development Program, and who, who will uh, chair the, the panel of experts from the FAO, from UNEP, from the World Bank. So Lily, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Didier. Um, as we've heard today, sustainable cold chains matter uh, a lot. Um, and we know they reduce food loss and waste. Uh, in a population where the population is increasing and many people still go hungry, as, as Toby mentioned. Um, we know sustainable cold chains can help increase farmers' incomes, and we know they reduce emission of greenhouse gases and contribute to solving our climate crisis. So um, why are they not, uh, why are we not seeing a rapid scale up of cold chain, uh, sustainable cold chain? So I hope that we can discuss this with our uh, expert panel today. Uh, we have with us, um, Leo Joseph Blitz from uh, ESMAP and World Bank Group, um, Olivier Dubois uh, from FAO, uh, Ayman uh, El Taouni from UNEP, and Brian Holuj from the Africa Center on uh, Sustainable Cooling and Cold Chain and uh, UNEP. Um, so maybe I'll just start with the first um, uh, general question. Um, you know, we heard a lot today about um, various uh, different projects that are uh, helping scale up sustainable cold chain. And um, we heard about a, a need for a systems approach. I think that was something we heard repeatedly throughout the presentations. Uh, what, is a way, what is the way forward for, for international assistance, since these are all, you're all international assistance organizations, in adopting a more country and needs driven and systems perspective in, in projects on, on food systems and cold chain. And are there some countries that could be uh, looked at or who could act as, as examples um, for others? So to start, maybe I can um, start with Leo. Do I see you, Leo? Yep, I can see you. Can you see and hear okay. me from? Yes, I can hear you. I just on my screen, I wasn't able to see. It's my view. Sorry, thank I see you, you now. <laughs> Over to Good you. afternoon and evening, everyone. Um, it's uh, th thank you so much for the question, Lily, and um, for the amazing background from all of the practitioners here. I think we've had so many rich examples there. I could just uh, draw from them, and in fact, uh, I think that's that's definitely one of the things I'll do. Um, what I really want to emphasize is that absolutely, this is essential. There's no um, there's no disagreement that cooperation is needed. But I, what, what I'd say we, is very critical is that there are two dimensions of this, that we need the actual bottom-up country-level insights, that this work must be grounded in the real examples of individual countries always. There's no room for conceptual cut and pastes or expertise from first world pushed into emerging economies. Um, where I'd say that does come in is the second part of the equation which is that we really must integrate all of these global lessons and best practices. And the good news is that there are a lot of those, um, either well-established um, where we can have that transfer, but particularly, and this is where I'd move on to, um, if you like, the, the challenge, how to even know what are the lessons learned and the best practices, I'd say is one of our greatest challenges right now. Um, and Tony put, put it well. Um, uh, Toby, sorry, um, I'd say to avoid at all costs isolated and fragmented piecemeal efforts. That's the way forward. <laughs> um, and in order to do that, that's where we need the coordination. We need systems between um, systems of communication, but also the humility to recognize that 
let's not all go out reinventing the wheels. Let's see if we can take someone's wheel, someone else's body, someone else's roadmap, you know, and together create something new. So that's the biggest challenge, I'd say, understanding what the roles are for that. Um, but I would say we need, therefore, to go broad, as we say, um, across different sectors. We need integrated approaches from what we've heard earlier. It really is no good going developing a cold chain if you've got a culture that doesn't recognize the need for cool, for chilled produce. It seems very simple, but it's really not, of course. Um, and then an example, that's an example of the broad integration that I'd say that we need. And then there's going deep um, within each of those approaches. Again, as um, uh, ACES has a lot of this mapped out for us with the systemic approach. Going deep means having a systematic linkage from that farm to fork um, about what is needed. Uh, I, I'm sure getting close to my time, but as the World Bank, I'd say, uh, representing the World Bank, I'm, I'm from the SMAP team, which is the specialist team that's supporting the main body of the World Bank investments to, to advise, to inform, to, to help um, you know, support those teams with expert knowledge. What we're really seeing is the need for different kinds of finance, let's say, different kinds of support um, to solve different problems. It's no good bringing hundreds of million dollars credit schemes, which has been a hard wrought um, effort by many projects with the government loans from the World Bank and others. If you don't have an established commercial market where you've already met those companies needs, say with grants, with pilot project support, with the role for philanthropies and other organizations. So I'd say the need for a roadmap as well for all of us together to define what that is and to allocate roles, to actually know where we hand the baton on to one another, to build that um, runway for investment. And as is often said, what is the off-ramp? What's the sustainability approach? When one donor or one project finishes, then ultimately we're seeking, we, we need this collaboration um, uh, in order to reach that sustainable, like steady state where we then hand over to commercial investment and commercial operations, I would say, and then leave that down to different forms of technical support, but no less necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo. Um, so uh, bottom up country insights um, think, makes me think of data <laughs> and uh, roadmaps uh, to allocate roles, to bring people together, um, to make sure it's cross sectoral, integrated and uh, coordinated. Um, does that sound similar to what you would say, Ayman, if I can turn to you uh, on, on the way forward um, with regards to international assistance to supporting uh, countries with more needs-driven and system perspective? Thank you, Lily, and uh, good afternoon, good evening to some, and thank you for the opportunity to join you today. I totally agree with Leo. He nailed the truth of the real problem, the coordination. And the, we all understand that this sector is fragmented at the national level among different authorities. And currently the current intervention are usually being led from the environment di angle or from the energy angle or from the food loss angle. And unless we set the scene for the government, especially in developing countries and working together, then it's gonna be always like this and fragmented and continue to be fragmented. This gets us to the uh, area of the data that you've mentioned, uh, Lily, in terms of the availability of data. This is a big question mark in, every, in all countries, even in industrial countries. The availability of reliable data about the different constituents of the food culture chain subsectors from farm to fork is not that much uh, worldwide. And I think it's a, it's a sector that has been only visible to the attention of the global community very recently. So there is a lot of initiative being going on, but still not yet all streamlined in the right direction. The opportunity of providing some kind of a holistic approach like the African Center uh, example, like the coding action plan example, is a good entry point to bring all together in one, in, in, on one table to start discussing. But before discussing details and action, you need to have data and information. So the example that we are trying to follow is to build up some kind of a structured data collection, collection methodology to pilot in some countries and to see how the picture would look like and this, how this would help countries in identifying the priorities and the gaps. 
And in doing so, we are trying to do it, not only focus on the environment dimension or the refrigerant side, but getting into information as much as feasible, data and information related to energy, economics, environment, as well as food loss. Unless you complete the whole cycle, the decision making can, cannot see the full uh, angles of the picture and take the right decision. So 100% agree about the importance of the data as a starting point for any uh, meaningful and impactful uh, effort. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ayman. Maybe I can segue to you, Brian. Um, I think in the, the discussion so far, we have heard about this sort of integrated approach, um, as we heard from Leo and echoed again by Ayman. Um, and sort of a systems approach, coordinated approach. I mean, you're doing a lot of that with um, ACES. And um, I guess the question here would be maybe from your experience, are there uh, specific areas where there's a need for um, capacity building and training more than others? I mean, of course, this whole integrated approach assumes that you need capacity building across the chain, but is there uh, one step on which we should focus our actions more than others as an international community? Um, or would you say it's dependent on the country? Uh, what, what is your experience? What can your experience tell us about, about this? Sure. Thanks again for the opportunity to be here. Lily and I, I are uh, colleagues. So I'll give perspectives again, for, uh, sort of Africa uh, work that we've been doing. Um, but I think some of this applies uh, quite a bit more broadly. So maybe just to riff quickly on what Iman had pointed out in terms of cutting across sectors. Um, when we're looking at policy opportunities, it's important that in the case of Rwanda, for example, the National Agricultural Export Board is part of the discussion. But in order to reach this target to double uh, food exports or triple food exports road, you have to have the right infrastructure in place. Well, that's the, the Ministry of Infrastructure. Uh, or if we want to think about how do you get better uh, opportunities for aggregation so that you can have a viable market opportunity beyond say one uh, value chain uh, in the ag sector. Let's talk to the Ministry of Health. Uh, Ministry of Environment's working on the Montreal Protocol, the refrigerants that are in the equipment that we're dealing with. And then a lot of this at the end of the day when we're talking about the cold chain is rooted in the energy supply. Rwanda has one of the world's best um, rates of expanding electrification in the country. But if we're only thinking about electricity-based solutions, it's going to make things quite challenging. So when you look at things like the governance structure of what we do, we have representatives at the highest levels and then more programmatically in the governance that cut across Ministry of Agriculture, Health, Infrastructure, Energy, Environment, um, industry associations. It truly has to be holistic if you're looking at how do we build out the cold chain nationally? What are the real opportunities over the long haul? And a lot of what we see, and this is some getting back to the training question you posed, is that an individual piece of kit dropped in or helicoptered into some rural community X as a piece of demonstration can raise some awareness, but it's not helping you understand how do you optimize that so that when we talk about from farm to fork, where is that fork located? Is it still going to be just the nearest village before something spoils? Or are we looking at a lucrative international market that heretofore was never possible. But unless you have this kind of aggregation across sectors, you have the data informing that process, you've done modeling and optimization runs to figure out where should we best have that uh, aggregation point? Where can the distribution uh, companies get involved? This is gonna be really tricky. So a lot of the training we're looking at is getting different people across domains at the table. And this is a question in the policy arena. So the officials get uh, the big picture, small entrepreneurs, agribusinesses, practitioners who need to work on this equipment. Do they understand the safety considerations of the refrigerants, uh, so on and so forth. So I'll pause there, just touching on a, at a high level, cross-cutting issues. But I guess today, uh, aggregation and then cutting across sectors is going to be critical. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, so I guess the aggregation um, aspect, uh, maybe with that, I can, I can segue to you, Olivier. Um, uh, you know, we've heard about the need for data. We've heard about the roadmap development um, as a key thing um, in terms of where we focus our efforts on, on cold chain and how to take this sort of holistic means approach forward. And we've heard now also, and of course about working across the 
uh, sectors, whether it's energy, agriculture, environment, infrastructure, ministries, you know, whichever, um, to make sure that this is uh, comprehensively taken forward in countries, the cold chain uh, development. Um, what would you say, and also this, this point on the aggregator, um, uh, what would you say from, from your perspective would be, from FAO perspective, um, is the way forward on international assistance to help countries take this sort of um, systems perspective on uh, cold chain? Yes, um, hello everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel discussion. I mean, this uh, seminar has, has had great presentations, but in a way they illustrate a major weaknesses of the way we intervene in the countries, which is through sectoral projects. You had two projects on agriculture and one project on health, and none of them made the connection between health and food. And, and this is because they have to be anchored to sectoral ministry. And, you know, one way to, to try to get over this major weakness is when, when we go into a country and look at the energy needs for food chains, we recommend that it's usually accepted to have like a multi-sectoral working group, a cross-ministerial working group. But that's just a, an ad hoc thing. If you really want something to work and, and have a, a program rather than a project approach, you need almost a committee or whatever mechanism super above the sectoral ministries. You know, at the Ministry of Planning, Prime Minister, somewhere there where there's like a committee which would combine health, food, and energy, maybe others, maybe water. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then when a, a donor or whatever organization comes and says, I want to do this cold chain for health, that committee says, hang on a second, you need to look at the other sector. So the country driven needs should start from there. And you need, you need this, then this, this committee, which should be strong enough to tell to the sectoral ministries, you guys need a focal point, a focal unit to work on cold chain. Otherwise we will ne never reach this integration between sectors. So that's for me, and, and we do that in FAO when we talk about food security, which again, integrates so many sectors. So I think in a way we are guilty from not having the integration because we always come up with projects. And of course the countries accept that. So I think from the countries, really they should be recommended to have this committee super above these sectoral things. And when you have that, then you need to multiply the ACES type of things in different places. Because I think this is from a, a, a technology and education point of view, the parallel to the institutional structure that I just suggested. So that for me is absolutely crucial. Otherwise we'll be talking about this integration in, the, in, in 10 years from now. But that's one thing. The other thing is you almost need to start from not from the cold chain aspect, but from the food chain uh, aspect, or from the health uh, chain issues. You know, the Bangladeshi project was really great about that because they, they, they bumped into some problems because they didn't look at the food chain, maybe, challenges. And, you know, maybe farmers don't, farmers don't care about cold. Uh, maybe they need to be sensitized. And, and, you know, you need to look at, is there a market for cold chain product or you know the, the wet market is enough can they afford better quality project uh, products so you need specialists to start from the health and 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 or food chain issues and then you bring in all the, the cold chain issues and I think this is not done enough you come up with technologies and say I want to implement my cold chain technologies without giving enough attention on the use of the culture. So that's another thing. And for me, another thing which we should do is look at, I call this water energy food nexus. It's, it's hype as a key sector, but let me illustrate that with one technology which has been hyped as great because you don't need energy. It's the vapor compression technology. Right, you don't need the energy, but you need a lot of water because it's about vapor. So if you, in, you implement that, 
then you must be, make sure that you don't take water from people or from livestock in the first place or from the health sector. So this for me is, that, is the kind of things that come to my mind uh, based on our experience, but also on the great presentations that I've heard. Thank you. Uh, yes, Lydia, thank sorry. you very much. Just one thing on the data. We need to provide intelligence on the cost benefit analysis, on the locations, you know, really solid feasibility analysis. We, we do that, but we need to do that more. Again, avoiding this tendency to come, do a quick and dirty analysis, and then moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Maybe I will actually start with you before going back around. I, I do want to ask you a question um, following what you said, and that is, what role can you know FAO play in in advancing sustainable cold chain? Um, you know, you have these these um, excellent points. You plan to take it forward. Look, I, I think FAO, but not only FAO, I think we need a coalition of international organizations who approach the governments and suggest ways to institutionalize this, to the need for this integrated approach. And this requires efforts because we have money to spend, I mean, from the, from the banks, we, we, we have projects to implement. So we, we almost need to, as, as a donor, to, as, no, as a, dev, a development community, together with the countries to explain that and say, well, can you at your governmental level change the way you approach that and we can help you do that? So that's, that's one thing. And the, I mean, FAO is in a position where, because we work in 153 countries, I mean, other, other international organizations working in, in many countries as well. So we could, again, in these countries, do a country level approach to this integration at an institutional way forward to integrate these, all these aspects. And okay, mm. aside from that, I mean, of course, in FAO, we combine uh, competence on food chains and on, 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 on energy for these food chains. WHO combines the same on, on health and, 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 uh, and, uh, and also for, uh, coal chains. Together with others like SMAP and, 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 and UNEP, we can also bring in other aspects. But I think first, better integration between ourselves, the way we go into these countries might be difficult, but maybe probably necessary. Okay, thanks, Olivier. I think that's, a, that's an echo I'm hearing across all of the experts on the panel. Um, maybe I can turn to you, Brian. I mean, I uh, first of all, I, I think we have a very short amount of time left. Um, so um, I'm gonna ask everyone to, if they can keep to one minute. I think we were, unless we were given more time, but I think we have to wrap up in about three minutes. But what I would like to, Give you a chance to come in on is first of all i know that aces is connecting i think I, I read the comment from toby that you are actually connecting from the health perspective and the food perspective did you want to comment maybe on on how that experience has been um responding to what olivier said you know have you been able to come in at that super super national level to coordinate and, and have that entry point in the country in a more global uh than just a sectoral approach Sure. Thank you very much. Um, part of the genesis of ACES was Rwanda had a, a national cooling action plan, which the Cool Coalition has done a tremendous job of, of promoting those. And um, interestingly, when they adopted it, it was adopted at the cabinet level. So you had marching orders coming from the highest levels that this is something that applies across government. And it called for explicitly a cold chain strategy. Well, that that provided, again, the backdrop because we had the backing of Minister of Health, Minister of Education, which is interesting when you think about the, the, the training for future generations and then an environment, infrastructure, so on and so forth. So that very model from a Rwanda uh, context is what we're looking at in aggregate for ACEs, though. The governance structure, this isn't a Rwanda center. It happens to have the headquarters housed there, but it's a Pan-African center. So the African Union is part of our governance structure in the steering committee, the East African Community Secretariat, those have, of course, within them, uh, broad brush uh, engagement on these different sectoral areas. So the whole model from the top down is meant to do exactly that. The other thing I just mentioned very quickly is that this is 
all of your center of excellence. This isn't UNEP United for Efficiency Center. It's not the Center for Sustainable Cooling. It's not the Rwandan Government Center. We're all helping to provide an enabling an environment. This is an umbrella where we hope to really, truly, perhaps for the first time, bring people together, uh, leveraging their different resources, uh, funding availability, projects, so that we can do this in a joined up way. Let's open up some of the projects, show who's doing what in country X, um, our first spoke or deployment pathway is going to be in Kenya, for instance. Ton of activity by FAO, World Food Program, World Bank, CLASP, you name it, in Kenya. So we're able to use this in a way to, to say everybody, we have different areas of expertise. Let's better deploy this in an optimal fashion instead of learning halfway into a project. Oh, Organization X also has something going on across the country. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, I guess that everyone will be able to get everyone's contact somehow uh, after this workshop uh, to further connect on joint actions. Um, so I'm in, if I just could turn to you very quickly on the data uh, aspect, and many safety workshop will be starting in five minutes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yes, I just, you know, um, Olivia was saying that we need to, just because you framed all the <laughs> problems, so it's good way for me to ask the question. Um, you know, this cost benefit analysis, and avoiding the technology approach, how is the data gathering uh, work that you're doing helping that? I guess that's, that's a way forward, no? And is it yeah. covering also cost benefit analysis? It, it doesn't go to the level of uh, cost benefit analysis, but it, it includes information on the economics, CAPEX and OBEX of the existing inventory of application as a starting point. Understanding that we already having, uh, we are facing a lot of gaps in finding the right and correct data uh, in countries. So the exercise it, itself is intended to be not as a one-time exercise, but it's said to be as a long-term investment to help countries identify the gaps and improve the logging and recording as well as information collecting uh, uh, capacities. Uh, I would like to highlight two things quickly. One is what Olivier mentioned. We are only, only always looking at the food loss side and forget about the food safety. This is very important aspect and there's little information available at quantifying the impact of this in relation to the cold chain. The second one is the international policies that is reflecting the cold chain in its literature are very few. We only see this in 2019 in the Rome Declaration of Montreal Protocol in the UNIA decision reflecting the cold chain, sustainable cold chain in the international policy. And I, we have an opportunity with the COP, uh, the climate uh, work that's ongoing in the current years to raise this portfolio to a higher level in terms of the policy in order to set some kind of a scene to the government in terms of the uh, targets and indicators that can be followed. Because currently some of the governments like Rwanda, they have a visionary, visionary enough to set uh, the cooling action plan at a higher level, but the rest of countries would need some kind of an international force to push for that direction. Thanks. Thanks, Ayman. And um, maybe Leo, just turning to you very quickly as last um, uh, intervention. Uh, if you could uh, say what is the one priority action that you would promote as a first step towards overcoming uh, some of these challenges and scaling up on, on a robust cold chain development, what would that be? Um, I think I'll just pick up um, what everyone's been saying here. It really is what we can call this multidisciplinary task force with expertise in all the right areas across the right teams. But frankly, as I'm saying this, it sounds like a dream team. You know, it is, how realistic is this? What I would like to finish on. I'd say what is needed is serving the needs of a government who is elected to represent its people, we need to think of them as the main, what is their capacity for absorption? You know, what is realistic for them? What are their other priorities? Let, let's, let's work to in harness together, but maybe bringing the expertise to them rather than demanding so much of them. Um, I would like to think, and particularly as the World Bank, we're often there working with the government ministries and we know firsthand and the challenges they have of simply operating and, and meeting their other mandates. So let's not forget the context within which we operate. Thank you. 
well, with that, I'll just say thank you to all of our expert panelists. And uh, we I just will say a quick shout out that we do at the Pool Coalition have a cold chain working group, and we are trying to promote um, the efforts of all of you here so that some of the awareness issues can be overcome, which might be a precursor to setting up those supranational, <laughs> supranational committees that, you know, um, uh, bring the different uh, ministries together. So uh, where we can help, please be in touch and um, hopefully we can um, uh, have you join our cool chain working group efforts uh, at the Cool Coalition. And with that, I'll just thank all of our panelists and um, hand back to the chair um, of the uh, workshop, Didier Coulomb. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lily. Uh, I will be very short because uh, we are a little late, but thank you for all the panelists, all, all the people who had the possibility to present the projects. Of course, you will have, uh, I hope, a lot of other projects and uh, well, with the help of all these organizations uh, in order to have a comprehensive approach of all the, the issues regarding coaching.